Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another of our Inside Coach Masterclass Conversations here with Beyond Pulse. Um, just me today, Mr. Tom Shields, uh, my co-host, regular partner in crime, Mr. Mark Wilson, is, uh, is absent today, so um, it will just be me that you have to deal with, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I'm absolutely delighted today to be welcomed by Mr. Greg Gatz, who, as many of you know, uh, is a famed coach across at the University of North Carolina. Um, he's a seven time, nine time, sorry, national champion across both men's and, and women's soccer and has spent 19 years at UNC. So Greg, what I'd, I'd like you to do for the benefit of people who are, are less familiar with um, your profile and, and the prominent role that you've played in, obviously, to very much nationally acclaimed soccer programs. I'd, I'd like you to provide a little bit of background on your journey. Um, obviously, the role that you play across all of the Olympic sports at, at UNC and, and understanding for the players and, and coaches on the line that today we'll be talking heavily around uh, physical development and the transition from perhaps the, the youth club and, and high school environment into college and, and what you can you can expect from there. So, um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Again, appreciate the patience in getting you on here. And, and if you could take it away from there, then I'll, uh, I'll start with the questions. All right, great, Tom. Thanks for having me come on. I apologize for the difficulties. Just when you think you got things figured out, uh, something steps in your way. But uh, I hope we can, we can get this going. Let me know, please, if, it, if, it doesn't, if it's not working right or, or the sound goes out or something like that, because we're, we're on a phone, obviously, right now. But uh, appreciate you having me come through. Um, yeah, so... As, as Tom mentioned, you know, I, I've been at North Carolina a long, long time. Um, it's actually, you probably got that off the internet. It needs to be changed, but we're heading into uh, 23 years now at, at North Carolina. First started here in 98, so been, been working with all our teams. I'm the director of strength and conditioning for uh, the Olympic sports, so everybody other than football and, and uh, American football and men's and women's basketball. So, we we work with about 23 different sports. We have anywhere from 500 to 600 athletes that we train out of our facility here at UNC. Um, so I've been really blessed to be at a, at a, at a really neat uh, environment, neat uh, university. It's got a lot of, uh, a lot of great people um, over the years that I've met, been fortunate enough to work with a, a uh, Hall of Fame coach in Anson Dorrance with his women's program for the for the course of these years and, and really enjoyed that aspect and that development over the over the years. Um, my journey really started um, back where most of you coaches I think are high school back at a high school level. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys for what you do with what you have. Um, it's not always the best situation but uh, those those are the grassroots the, the foundation points for for the athletes that we get eventually. And so I, I really appreciate the work and, and stuff that you guys do with your athletes on a day-to-day -day basis. But I was down in Florida for about 12 years working at a, a few different high school programs and uh, teaching uh, physical education, some strength training classes as well. Um, was coaching just about anything I could get my hands on as far as sports, so tennis, wrestling, they had competitive weightlifting down there, um, football, all, all kinds of different things that I could get get some experience, coaching experience with. And it, it, it definitely uh, shaped me for where I'm at now as far as how that, that grassroots uh, foundational level works when you're dealing with that age group. So um, over the years, you know, obviously working with that, I really had a – as my, my years developed through in the high school level, I really got a grasp on and really liked and gravitated towards the preparation part of, of coaching. Or the sport so the, coaching the sport was great doing the skill development and so forth and, 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 the, and the competition was awesome but I really liked the the aspect of preparing the athletes for competition and so it kind of gravitated towards you know doing more of the strength conditioning type of piece of, of each sport uh, I had the classes that I was teaching um, fortunate enough to get to this area here when we vacation my wife and I vacation one time uh, up in this area and really liked the area the triangle area that has a bunch of different colleges universities and uh, really liked it. Um, it 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 worked out that she took a job transfer uh, up in the Raleigh Durham area and we just decided that I was going to stop coaching at this at this level and see if I could step up into a strength conditioning position at a university level so we moved up here I volunteered for two years here uh, in the strength and conditioning department. At that time, we had everybody working together. So we had all sports together, football and basketball included. 
So again, another way to kind of just develop, um, got some really good experience with some really great athletes. I look back at the years now, back in the nineties there, and we were working with some Olympians over the years and, and how well they prepared and, and what they did was a real neat experience as well. So that was kind of my, my journey. It's not a, a journey that, uh, everyone would, would be going through at this, at this level, at this point, a lot of times it's internships, it's graduate assistantships, and then you get to a full-time job. I was just fortunate enough to get into a position where things just kind of fell through and, and opened up so that I could uh, start working with uh, this level uh, athlete. But it's been a, a really neat journey over the 23 years. And obviously, as everybody's going through now, we're going through a different way of life and things are going to change. And we're, we're seeing that now and coaching is going to look a lot different. So, you know, we're just preparing ourselves for the next, next uh, day right now and, and trying to see where we can go with that. Uh, with our training aspect right now. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that. And, and apologies that we undersold the uh, the vast nature of your experience to start with, Greg. That's uh, no, no problem. A risk for, for somebody on the website who is... Uh, yeah. yeah, they're slipping. <laughs> um, no, thank you. And, and look, I've always been fascinated by the, the journey and the story of, of our kind of esteemed guests, and, and you're no different. And I think it's, um, for any of the coaches listening, it's it's a great message to them of, you know, you, you kind of earn your stripes and you, you know, you, you put in the hard yards before, you know, great opportunities present themselves to you clearly. So, and for all the players, obviously, what a, what a wonderful kind of example that is as well, that, um, you know, you earn the opportunity to, to obviously, you know, gain such a prominent career at a, a program of, of such esteemed, of such an esteemed reputation. So, um, as you said, you know, you, you, you've got a, a vast a vast depth of experience and um, have seen some of the very best work and obviously you work alongside Anson as you know as you rightly say a hall of famer and the most successful coach collegiate coach in US history so um, a ton that obviously we want to dive into focusing more heavily on the, the soccer aspect of things here today um, I can see this is a, a selfish perspective but I can see one of uh, actually a, a player of ours who's on the line who's coming to UNC in the fall so this might be an interesting conversation for her there we go <laughs> very close attention um so Greg I'm, I'm gonna start like this we obviously spoke offline last week and we were discussing exactly what you've just said in in the current climate how important it is for for people to understand um what the next level looks like and especially what the next level looks like when perhaps your traditional way of preparing is um is hindered so, you know, we're, we're going to start here, Greg, and, and I'd like to ask that from, a, from an intensity or a demand perspective, can you provide a couple of things that you think incoming freshmen specifically are surprised about when they begin their careers as a, as a, as a Tar Heel with you guys? Um, and really just how big is the jump from the high school life or, or club soccer life that they lead to one of the, the biggest Division One programs in, in the country? Can you... Yeah, is there anything that sticks out to you that, you know, you would say, be prepared for this? Don't be surprised by it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, and this probably goes for all our sports that we see here. But, um, you know, we're talking about soccer today. And what I've seen over the years, you know, one of the, one of the limiting factors, I think, um, overall is, is the overall strength value of the athlete. Um, they get here, they see the, the, the new physicality, the different level of physicality of the game. They see the different speed of the game. Those two things, when they step on the pitch, are, are really eye-opening for, for any freshman, I think. Um, and obviously, they're, they're coming from a, probably from a club background program where you know, they're probably one of the top three, team, uh, three players on their team as far as what they could do um, and, and their ability. But I think some of the limiting factors are, are the general strength aspect of, of our freshmen, incoming freshmen, uh, and how they, you know, accept that, that lower value, the lower tier right now to, to be able to step in and, and, and get themselves in a position to maybe get on the field. And we have a lot of freshmen, incoming freshmen, that will be starters uh, on the field. May not be initially, but by the end of the season, they'll be starting. And that, that difference in, in, in the lower level maybe coming into and, and in entering that that college level will show up eventually mid mid season end of the year where you may see more injuries possibly you might see more fatigue inability to recover so um, I think the biggest thing and biggest challenge for us is is to get an athlete up to speed as, as much as we can I will say this though I think over the last 
probably six to eight years, the aspect of strength and conditioning in a club system, in the academy systems coming in has gotten way better. For sure. uh, I know when I, when I first started, it was, it was pretty much non-existent. And when you got a kid in, in, in a freshman year here, they literally were never in a weight room or a gym setting. Um, they may have done a little bit of it, but it was not part of their process and their, their uh, you know, getting themselves developed for their game. So I think the biggest thing is to understand that you're going to need some foundational strength. You're going to need some foundational speed work. Uh, that's another thing that I think that people don't think about. They think of soccer as an aerobic sport, which it is, but it does have those moments in the game where you have to have a high intensity run, a sprint, a stop, start, jump in the air. It's a lot more intense than, than you may think it is by watching it. But those, those aspects I think are, are um, something that needs to be uh, trained. I mean, if you don't train it, you lose it. Right. So I know a lot of coaches, they worry about the, the fitness, the fitness in, in the aerobic capacity and to the extent that they lose some of the, the explosiveness of the athlete. And so I think that's probably the, the number one thing is those foundational pieces of strength, you know, mobility, speed, the, the normal components that are going to help that athlete become a better soccer player and keep them safe. Perfect. And we're going to talk, you know, obviously I appreciate that we've, we've got a blended audience, some of players, some of coaches. So we're going to try and, and touch a couple of, of different factors throughout the conversation, but um, you know, what you've just said, I think we'll, we'll refer a little bit back to tactical periodization and game models of making sure that we expose players to the types of actions we want to see in a game. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'm just curious though, sticking with, with the players for a moment, based on what you've said, um, obviously the difference, uh, and for anybody that, you know, is, is kind of more uncertain or less aware, obviously, you know, when you're entering as a freshman, there's a, there's a chance that you're competing with playing alongside or competing against people that, you know, especially if there's a red shirt senior in there that have got four years, three or four years experience and, um, and time in that environment ahead of you. And, and candidly, if you're a 17 year old and you're about to embark on that journey and you're going in and playing with 22 year olds, it's child to adult and, you know, every kind of rain, rain, uh, realm of the spectrum. So, uh, you know, what, a, what I'm curious of Greg, cause you, you touched upon, um, you touched on a few things. For me, fitness and football fitness sometimes gets misinterpreted to, as you said, just the aerobic work, just running. So while we're very clearly not in usual circumstances right now, what would be some of the, the recommendations or advice you could give to players in terms of the, the best way to prepare? Because I'm curious, you know, with the, the type of emphasis on, on the, the time spent in the weight room when you do get to a division one program like yourselves, should players be doing more than, than just running as part of their weekly training cycle? Or, you know, even if we're not incoming freshmen and we're, you know, we're, we're 16, we're 15, 16, we're, we're still in around high school, you know, is running enough or should it be supplemented by, you know, some kind of body weight strength, certain loads? Like, could you give a basic overview on to, in terms of what you would recommend you know, a, a, perhaps a weekly schedule to look like, you know? Yeah. And, and again, it's going to depend on the age group. The, the training experience is huge, right? So if someone's not had any experience in, in, in the weight room or those regards, then you're going to go to the things like you're talking about the body weight and starting those foundation points. But yeah, I think if you're in a club setup or a club system where you do have some resources to use, you may even have a fitness coach and somebody, you may have a gym. I know some places that, that have all of that stuff and, and, and are, are able to do that. You know, you want to, you want to make it a routine, I think, as part of that, that weekly process. And, and it's going to change from, you know, in season when you're heavily loaded down in competition versus out of season where it may not have as much, and you're doing more practicing. But I think if you, if you lay a week out where, you know, you're, you've got maybe a couple of running sessions, you've got some type of an acceleration or, or a speed piece, because I think that's a piece that is very, very, um, or not used as much or trained as much um, in, a, in a soccer setting where it's just basically, I'm going as fast as I can. I'm in that 95 to 100% type of run effort and then I get some recovery time where it's not that panic mode where it's the, the normal anaerobic type of work where it's interval training where you, you, you're, um, 
you know, not able to, to hold on to that, that high level quality. Um, we do a lot of just five meters, 10 meters, 15 meter accelerations at a high rate. I'll have somebody time them. So every run's going through and there's a time that you have to try to match or beat uh, the, next, the next repetition. So the ability to be really explosive and work at, you know, top speed or end speed maximum rates um, is something I don't think a lot of people work on. I think that's an important part of the game because these transition moments in the game, when you go from defense to offense or vice versa, at a moment's notice, if you don't train that normally, you're not going to see that done very well or it's an injury risk hamstring pull or something like that so getting those athletes up to top speed is something that i think is important to maybe do once a week and and usually we'll do that early in the week when the kids are rested or athletes are rested coming off a weekend if it's an off-season type of mode that might be our first day um but then again you want you want that interval training you want anaerobic aerobic because that's part of the game um, once you develop those aerobic capacities and aerobic power points then maybe you're not doing that as much. You may be touch, touching that once a week, or you're going to invest that into your practice plan where it's maybe more open field, where it's longer intervals of play. Um, the lactate type of stuff can be done with the small-sided games, obviously with interval type of work, same type of training, a little bit more sport specific. Um, and then as far as strength value, we do – in gym, on field, after practice type of work, um, if we have to. I'm, I'm a proponent of inserting strength wherever you can put it. And it could be a 10 minute session, it could be a 20 minute session, it could be in the gym, it could be pre-practice, it could be post-practice. So any of those pieces that you can find an opportunity to gain strength, um, whether it's body weight bands, um, light dumbbells, and then uh, in accordance with what you're gonna do in the normal gym setting, I think is really important. Kids need to understand how to how to you know support themselves on the ground on the ground, especially younger kids. Bracing, uh, the ability to fend off and hold the ground, hold your position is obviously core strength. It's it's upper and lower working together. So I think a strength piece can be done any day, any time of the day, as far as you know, maybe maybe not after a long hard session, um, but pre practice. Um, or just by itself. Um, I think those are important concepts to kind of sustain uh, in your normal routine. For sure. And Greg, just while we're on that, I would, I would like to preface that it's super important that, that people aren't listening to this and it's like, I'm going to run to the gym and I'm going to live in the gym for seven days. And I'm going to, yeah. uh, because what you said, strength is super important and core strength obviously in soccer is critical. Um, but can you talk or touch upon the importance of being functionally capable of playing soccer and it's power to weight ratio it's not for those people that remember johnny bravo who was shaped like a triangle looks great on a beach you know maybe isn't the type of of soccer frame or physique that you would you would encourage can you, can you talk to both the boys and the girls and certainly the coaches listening just about the importance of you know power to rate ratios being lean being explosive being dynamic and, and physically resilient um, and robust and the importance of you know perhaps not being unbalanced and too top heavy right. and just, you know, just while we're on it. Yeah. I think that's a really important point too. And, and, you know, we've taken a holistic approach here. We're not just, uh, you know, weights, 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 heavy weights and, and bench squat and those types of things. We use those, those movements. You got to think about the, the movement patterns and the, and the shapes you make on this, on the soccer pitch, right? You know, I'm jumping, I'm squatting, I'm lunging, I'm, I'm pushing off, I'm, I'm pulling an opponent possibly. You know, I'm, I'm in those positions where it's not just an isolated movement. It's, it's top to bottom. It's that glue of the core system in the middle that's keeping that together, keeping you in a brace position where you don't get off balance or you don't get thrown to the ground. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the type of lifting we're talking about is, you know, what's appropriate for a soccer player. So... You know, in general terms, we'll do some type of a squatting movement, and that can include a step up. It can include lunges. Jumping actions are good as far as leg work. Um, and then we'll do some pushing, pulling. You know, it's just general, general training. It doesn't have to be overloaded so much that uh, you're slowing yourself down or you're bounding yourself up with muscle mass that you can't move. If you watch soccer, as you all know, it's a fluid game. It's, it's, it's graceful, right? It's a lot of different movements at once, different positions that, that the athletes are getting in on the field. So that's how you should train. We, we train a lot of top to bottom. Um, we, we do multi-joint, multi, -joint, multi 
plane type of work. So if I'm working forward and backwards, I'm also working sideways, I'm working rotational patterns. And that could be with a dumbbell doing a lunge, forward lunge, lateral lunge, rotating lunge. So those things will connect the athlete top to bottom as well as transfer better on the field. So, you know, that, that, is, that is part of what, what our, our concern is that making sure that we're doing things that will transfer as well as keep them healthy um, as an athlete, as a soccer athlete. Perfect. And I think that word, Greg, is so critical. Player or coach that's listening right now, the work that, that you're doing in practice or, or off the field, like you said, transferability, how applicable is this to the demands that I face in the game? So obviously coaches, there's a lot of conversation about games-based approaches versus isolated activities. Right. Maybe so isolated in the current state of the, of the country. Um, but, but traditionally, you know, play-based activities to prepare and, and, right. coach, and then players, obviously the, the work that you guys are doing, if it doesn't look like it fits to the game and, and meet the demands of the game, it's probably a, you know, your time is probably better spent right. elsewhere. So um, yeah, really. And I, and I would also add to that too, yeah. you know, we, we, um, you know, doesn't mean we can't do some isolating work. There might be a return to play injury athlete that we might have to stop and I need more muscle mass on this athlete. Or it might be during our initial assessment evaluation, I'm looking at an athlete. I think he needs an extra day in the weight room just doing, you know, some, some general strength work to, to increase that body mass. If you look at some of these, these high level players, these pro players, EPL players, their legs, some of these guys' legs are massive. They're strong, though, and they can still move and run and, ex and be explosive on the field. So there is some, some, some need for, for muscle, lean muscle mass because it's going to help you perform and it's going to protect you as well. But, um, you know, in, in general terms, like you're talking about, we're going to stay with a top to bottom, inside out type of approach to making that athlete a strong soccer player. Perfect. Um, I'd like to to touch we just beyond pulse we, we just released some of the data that we've kind of collated um during lockdown so april and, and may and then obviously as, as clubs across the country have started to return to the fields late june early july um some of the data being returned uh, suggests that uh, team practices typically demand about 30 percent more um whether it's time at high speed um, whether it's uh, obviously percentage of time up above eighty percent of a max heart rate, instead of just the, the, the both the internal and external load that players are, are going through, seems to be higher, obviously in a team setting and, and with coaches than than by themselves. So my question is, you know, knowing that a lot of the players listening are responsible for their their continued preparation and development away from their formal settings, and certainly. God forbid we have a second lockdown or, or even now in the summer where, you know, programs might be less consistent than usual. What advice could you give the players on in, in terms of making sure that the intensity that they train with independently replicates that which they display in a team setting? And perhaps are there any great examples, obviously, as we started the conversation with you, you've worked alongside nine national championship winning uh, teams across your career as, as a Tar Heel. Um, any great anecdotes of people that, you know, would be the embodiment of, of that person who was always ready and, and never let up and, and kind of used the time away from the field to, to really maximize their development? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. And we're, we're going through the same thing. You know, we didn't have our athletes for four months. So we're just now returning back to, to getting some, some formal training with us and, and, you know, it's hard. It's hard if you're by yourself. It's hard if you don't have the resources. Um, I'm not sure how much you can mimic. You know, you're not going to be able to do that type of practice intensity per se by yourself. I would say to answer that question a little bit, I think this would be an opportunity to increase some of those, those maybe weaknesses or those, those um, training points that you may not hit as much when you are in a full loaded, you know, competition or, yeah you know, in a club setting where you may be able to do some more speed work, you might be able to do more strength work, power work, where you're doing plyometric type of stuff. So the intensity could be raised there, um, as well as help you, you know, maybe increase some of those weaknesses that you, you're not able to really get to with intensity when you are in a such a long type of a season with the, uh, the club program. So I think that might be more of a switch to 
to uh, uh, focus as far as, you know, when you are by yourself, well, maybe that's something I can do. And I, I've had a lot of our athletes experience this over this, these four weeks. And, you know, it was troubling because they, they just wanted to get out there, get on the pitch and be able to play and do their one-on-ones and do their 3v3s and so forth. But, you know, the, the, word, the message back to them was, let's, let's see if we can ramp up the other stuff that you don't really work on as much and get that up to par level. Right. Uh, where your skill work is at that point. So, so I think that's probably one pretty good area that that could be focused on if you are by yourself at this point. And to kind of answer the second part of that question, you know, we do, we've had, you know, I've, I've had tons of athletes that are kind of fit that mold that they are going to do what they need to do when they need to do it. And even if it's an additional piece where there's a lot of times where, you, where we have to back, back them off a little bit because you notice them doing too much and they start getting fatigued or they get broken down. But there's many a days we'd have a, a short wall out here at the stadium here on the other side of the, the turf outside our doors here. And, and there's many a days where I can be sitting in my office and hearing thunk, thunk, thunk against the, the wall there with a ball. And I'll go out there and there's a girl or two out there just hours just getting their footwork uh, yeah. right and, and working on that type of stuff. And, and so, yeah, we've had, you know, the ones that do weed themselves through the, the pack and get to that, that upper echelon where it might be a national team, it might be an Olympic team, it might be a pro team. They, they put the time in and it's not necessarily how much time they're putting in. It's the quality of that time. Yeah. So, you know, what that, that, that session looks like for themselves one-on-one is important and Anson he really he he preaches that it's it's that the ability of that person to take that next step level you're going to have to do something on your own it requires discipline it requires that that ability to take it upon yourself and get that that work done the right way and seek that type of that, that environment yeah perfect yeah such a great message and um again obviously those that are listening that use our our player app you can you can see, and it's for this reason exactly that you can monitor the quality of, of your practices. So as, as Greg, you know, brilliantly says the time that you're spending, if, if it is, you know, you want to challenge yourself to be, you know, X percentage of your session at, at high speed, you know, challenge, look at your workload, all the metrics that you can, you know, you can attain, um, obviously use that as a, as a guide, uh, so that it's not just your, your thoughts and feelings that go into it, but it's actually, you know, something there on, as data and, and insight for you to, to be able to take away. Um, yeah, no, Greg, thank you for, for, for that. Um, we will then, you know, you have mentioned the man himself. So let's, let's lead into specifically for, you know, potentially some of the players that, that are looking to go or, or want to understand, you know, have aspirations of being, you know, at UNC playing as a Tar Heel in the future, perhaps. Um, you've mentioned Anson. We spoke offline about how famed he is for his, competitive cauldron and the culture that is created with with you guys um if you could please share some of the standards that that players are expected to meet upon their kind of return in, in pre-season um any benchmarks anything that give an indication for you know the, the physical qualities of the players that you're looking for yeah and and, and you know he's he's you mentioned the, the competitive cauldron that's that's embedded throughout the whole program it's it's you know on field stuff all field stuff everything is a competition um and for female athletes especially that's not a hard sell or i'm sorry an easy sell when they first step on campus the athletes female athletes want to be comrades they want to they want to be they want to feel good about each other they want to be friends with each other and then to get on the field and be beating up each other against that that type of thing oops sorry yeah lose you. there we go um is is um something that's happens all the time and so that's developed it's it's groomed through the four years that they're with us and you know that's going to be uh part of what they do from the day to day um but as far as um metrics go and and you're right about the metrics that's 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 something that needs to be on the table for every athlete i think that's the best way to kind of motivate yourself that's the way you see improvement am I here or am I still there or where am I going? Um, so that's something that I think is important that you measure everything, which Anson does as well. It's practice time. It's, it's competitive time, whatever the, the, the situation it's measured, it's recorded. And the athlete knows exactly where they stand and when they know where they stand against the, their opponents and, the, and their teammates. Um, for us, as far as the women's, women's teams go, um, 
you know, we'll, we'll go through a test battery three times a week, I'm sorry, three times a year, um, depending what part, part of the season that is. And, you know, we'll, we'll have a speed measure. We'll have a beep test measure for our fitness. We'll do some strength values, which is uh, maybe a pull-up and a squat, a front squat, um, an agility, which is a Illinois agility test, um, which is uh, – you can look that up. It's uh, you know, it takes about 15 seconds or so, but uh, just to change direction type of work. And so that um, is something that is, is done three times a year with those athletes. Um, the standards, we, we set a gold, silver, bronze standard for the women. So our bronze standard is going to be the bare bone minimum. We want those athletes to be at when they come on campus. Um, they don't all get to that point. Um, it takes some work to get there. But we get to that point, hopefully, uh, as soon as possible, freshman, sophomore year, and then we're working towards the gold from then on out. And so those standards, depending on what the test is, will, will fluctuate as far as those levels go. But we're, we're trying to attain a high level. Uh, for example, for the women with the beep test, we go off the Spark, Nike Spark test score. So it's a little bit different than the levels that you normally see on the yo-yo. But for us, a 40 is a minimum. So the 40 score is a minimum. And he will always preach to those athletes, if you're trying to get to a national team level or to a pro level, you need to be at 50 and, or above. And so that right away tells them, okay, in order to even get close or have a sniff at that level, these are the standards I need to be at. And so we have that, again, through all the tests that we do with the men. Um, Cooper run is one big test, the two mile run. Um, they'll, they'll also do a yo-yo beep test um, and probably a speed and vertical jump. And the women do a vertical jump for power, lower body power too, as well. So, I mean, I could give you those numbers, but it's, I mean, I think it's, it's just a, a way to kind of, you know, use the components or develop those components that are going to help the game. And again, we talked about transitioning and, and transferring the, the training over these, these are what we look at as far as, the most important for us for sure so if you, if you could just obviously that, that the nike spark number is a good one for for the, any of the females that are listening that, that minimum of 40 maximum of 50 um is there either a level on the yo-yo or a time on the cooper run that you could share just for for the men specifically yeah for those with, a coop, with a cooper there's a 12 minute they run for 12 minutes and so they're trying to go for distance and we're looking at um 2800 meters or above as far as an excellent score uh, most of our guys that can hit that uh, usually right around that 2,400 to 2,800 meters. And that, I think, I think the 2,800 equates to a 1.7 yeah. miles, I believe somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously the, the ultimate goal is to get the two miles in 12 minutes, uh, six minute pace. So um, that's kind of our standard there, but uh, 2,800 meters at least to try and match that. Um, so, yeah, no, that, that's great. Thank you. Um, and I'm curious, <clears throat> the competitive cauldron, you're obviously, you know, your forte, as, as you've referenced, is there, you know, the physical side, the strength, the conditioning. Um, how important, though, is psychological readiness and the mentality to embrace competition in a program like yours? Um, and, you know, whether to players or coaches that are listening, any advice on how to integrate that within their own environment, you know, prior to getting to you? Because I think, again, if it's, if that type of mentality is only experienced when they step foot on campus, it, it probably is a bit of a shock. Um, so any recommendations there? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, like you said, it, it, it's, it's something you have to develop. It's not innate with a lot of people that competitive, there are competitive people, but um, at that, that age group level, you know, it's tough that everybody wants to be friends and everybody wants to be, you know, you know, have a friendly at atmosphere and, and environment to play in, which is fine. I mean, you want it to be fun as well, but uh, you know, we, we preach that from day one. And I think the best way is, is to, to put them in those uh, situations, the one-on-ones where everybody can watch or, or um, you know, measure and record everything because there's no there's no debating a a metric score. You know, if I got 20 touches or whatever the case may be, whatever we're trying to record or score, 
you know, that's something that's, that's concrete for that athlete to go back on and, and to measure against. And they'll also be able to see their component their opponents as far as, you know, what they're doing, where I need to bring my game to. And so I think it, the, the biggest thing is just to try and install that into your practice sessions, you know, any way you can, whether it's a relay, ball relay, or anything that's, that's going to develop that ability to measure and record and, and mark, um, I think can, can uh, improve those types of things. And just talking to the athletes about, you know, this is, this is a situation where you're going to feel like you want to back off. Um, but we're, we're trying to develop those, those situations where that athlete can, can push through and, and, and develop those, those self-discipline uh, um, types of uh, attitudes and, and the ability to, to, to compete. Absolutely. I was just trying to look. Um, there's, a, there's a great quote, um, and I want, to, I want to give credit, and the name of the gentleman, it's Mark something or other, and I, I can't for life think of his last name, but he speaks about the rule of three. Um, and it's in practice environments and game formation, uh, game settings where the player, male, female, whomever you are, you have responsibility for your own performance first, then the responsibility of your peers. So if somebody isn't upholding the standards that you think are right. necessary, it should be it should be you then to to kind of pull them up. And the third one is that ultimately the ambition for high performing programs is that the coach, the coach is number three on that pyramid and want to try to avoid him or her being the person who is is asking for more demanding more uh, the idea being that obviously um if the first two can be achieved success is more innately likely within within that practice environment so yeah, um, yeah that's a great point because you know the accountability to for our athletes too is, is huge that's something else we really preached is it's not just the accountability on the field but everywhere you know, whatever they're doing, their recovery, all that kind of stuff, and, and keeping each other accountable for the team. And so that's, that's something that's really a good point that, that, you know, that needs to be stressed. I mean, that's, that's huge for team development, chemistry, but it also puts you in that position where if there is a hard time or if there's something happening on the field that you guys, you know, everybody knows that each other's got, covers each other's back in those situations. And, and I think that's a, that's a good piece to develop as well, especially with the youth, you know, it's, it's not easy in that, in that regards, but uh, developing those accountability moments um, is, is a big part of what we do as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Greg, I'm going to go one more question for the players. And then I want to, I want to be able to, to ask one, maybe from more of a coaching perspective. And then those that are listening live with us now, um, feel free there is a chat function a q a box um if anybody has something that, that they would like to ask greg players specifically um obviously you you won't get this opportunity every day so i i would love it if if any of you guys are brave enough to to throw a message in there um but greg the, the last one just on on the physical side for players you, you mentioned it in the answer um i often feel like uh, the importance of a player's recovery, regeneration, or the holistic part of the preparation process that you spoke of right at the start of this conversation is, is often overlooked. We perhaps underemphasize the importance of appropriately and adequately and efficiently both preparing and recovering from competition. Um, could you, and, and I'd like you to speak directly to the players that are listening and you know, I guess secondly to the coaches, though, they should know better about the importance of, uh, of, of that part of the game. Um, and again, perhaps any pitfalls that, you know, may be witnessed if, if they don't take, you know, care of, you know, what they're putting into their bodies, what they're doing, you know, a cool down shouldn't, you know, how important it is to execute efficiently, correctly, um, if you could. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it is a very important part. And we consider it half of the training process, um, if not more. Um, and I, I just mentioned before about these these high level athletes that want to do more. They want to they want to keep pushing the curve as far as their their ability to do stuff and, and yeah. handle training. And so the ones that are very successful as well uh, are the ones that can handle that and, and understand that piece of it. It's the, we, we call this the invisible training of our process. So we're training when I can see them doing their stuff, 
when they're away from us, that's the invisible training. That's the toughest part to get them to understand that that's going to take and make you a better athlete and make that uh, next session, that next workout, that next week's workout a lot better and a lot uh, more trainable. So we really preach and educate along with our nutritional staff. And I know a lot of, you know, the, the lower club, club programs don't have those resources, but, you know, just in general terms, we want to talk to our athletes about the process of when you, you're done training, you go, like you were talking about, maybe a cool down period where you're, you're, you're relaxing a little bit, but then when you, when you leave the facility, it's all about that recovery, starting that recovery process. And that includes our nutrition. Um, you can't be a high level athlete at our, our place and, and not eat correctly, eat at the wrong time. You know, a lot of our freshmen come in with the inability to understand that because they're at home now and, and they have their parents to be able to cook for them and it's, and it's ready to go. When you come on campus, a lot of them have a wide open, you know, experience about, hey, how do I do this? When do I do this? And you've got a lot of different things going on in your routine on campus that it's tough to get those eating patterns in the right position until you really think about it. So um, we preach, you know, good, wholesome food, quality food as much as you can. Um, we'd rather have, you know, whole food versus drinks, shakes and stuff like that. Uh, it's okay. But if you're using that as meals, you're not going to see a, a, a good uh, setup there. So Food number one, because that's the fuel going back in. Protein usually will, will increase after our training sessions, you know, within those couple hours after training sessions and before bed. Um, need carbohydrates. I know there's a lot of um, research out there now or, or fads even where they're talking about you don't need to eat carbohydrates as an athlete. Um, those fads are, are bad. It's a bad setup because if you don't have the energy from the carbohydrates, you're not going to be very good on the field. So, you know, getting the right information from a nutritionist or from a sound professional as far as uh, eating habits and when to eat and, and what to eat is huge. Hydration during the session, after the session, before the session um, is important. That's going to take care of a lot of uh, flushing of those uh, materials that have been bound up from the session in your body. And then on top of that, um, you know, we talk about, um, you know, the rest, sleep is huge. And that's getting even more and more nowadays. We talk about brain health and all that kind of stuff. It happens at night when you're resting and repairing. And so if you're not getting quality hours of sleep, and we, we preach eight to nine hours a night if possible, um, and quality sleep, not uh, with your headphones on, not watching the TV and, and all that kind of stuff, real good quality sleep is going to help that preparation for the next next day uh, workout as far as uh, repair goes. And so those three three prongs of that that recovery process is huge for us. Um, you know, and, and you can also add the, you know, the foam rolling, the stretch, extra stretching and those pool activities and those types of things in there as well, which I'm sure a lot of people do. But those three things of sleep, hydration and quality food yeah. You pay huge dividends to your training process. And I can't preach that even enough, I, I think, because we see that every year coming in. And once those athletes figure that out, I've had some athletes that are really good on the pitch, but they, they didn't understand the other half of it. And when once they figure that out, it's a whole new ball game. They look like a whole new athlete. Yeah. Uh, great, great advice. Great insight. I, um, I'm always conscious and, and any of the players, my own players or people that I've coached will, will hear us say a lot and the kind of, the, I guess, the taglines, the cliches that we use here, but, you know, success leaves clues, walk your talk, you know, show me, don't tell me. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to say something, it's far harder to show something. And, exactly. I think, you know, you, you mentioned accountability and discipline in a program like yours. Um, one of my very good friends is is enamored right now with habits and you know understanding habits and qualities of high performing individuals and the reality is there's there's, there's commonalities across everybody and and this stuff for elite level footballers I, I love what you've said about the fact that it's you know 50 percent or more of your training process i think for players you understand that you know preparation performance recovery and then rest uh, there's there's four prongs and only one of them is what you're doing on the field um, so, you know, if you want to break it down and understand why, you know, Greg, why you've emphasized the importance of it so much, it's, you know, it's right there, right? It's, it's different. It's training. It's just not training with a ball. Um, so, you know, it's, it's ways of developing and improving just 
away from the football field. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. We have got a couple of questions and, and guys that have shared them. I am going to turn them to, um, tell you what, I'll, I'll do it now because there's a couple of these that are, are related to this and then we'll, we'll close on the coaching aspect. So um, one of the players here, what are some of the important things to add to our pregame routine and what should we do the day before um, and the day of the game to prepare? Could you speak about maybe food windows? Um, if there's any specific actions or movements, you know, explosive strength development that could be incorporated. Um, anything yeah, I think, yeah, I think the, um, the day before type of stuff, which we, we try to do as much too, is, is, you know, you're trying to, you, you're trying to get ready. Number one, you got, you, you got a day before the match, but um, we try to do some activation of the, of the uh, stimulate the, the nervous system a little bit. So, you know, a light little session of plyometrics um, the day before is, is not bad. Um, you know, some squat jumps, some, you know, whatever type of a little plyometric type of work is, is really good to kind of stimulate and activate a little bit. We've even seen that if we have a night match, some of those kids might want to do that in the morning of the match, the day of the match. So just, again, it's not to knock your body back. It's just to excite it a little bit to get it ready for that next, you know, high, high level type of performance. And, and as far as food goes, um, you know, you want to make sure you're not doing something that's, uh, you know, a fast food type of setup prior the night before or that day of in the morning. Say you've got an afternoon match, you know, quality stuff that's got some carbohydrate uh, aspect to it, some, some whole carbohydrates. So not, not refined type of sugar stuff, but, you know, a Gatorade, um, some fruit. Um, you got to be careful with fruit because of the it might upset your stomach a little bit, but bananas are good. Those types of things. Um, some quality uh, food and maybe a pasta type of uh, carbohydrate preloaded before the day before or even uh, during the morning, uh, mid-morning mid or if you have something at night as far as a match goes. So those things that, um, you know, help you recover uh, quickly but, uh, for the day before, but also get you ready for that match, I think is, is important. Uh, we use energy bars too, if you need to use that, that's, that's something that can be done on the field prior to. Uh, I would just not have a full, full stomach too close to the match. We usually eat a meal, pregame meal, about four hours out from the match. So that's kind of how we set it up. Um, I, I would say three to four hours is probably good enough there for that to get through your system and be able to uh, perform okay. Um, but what you do again, the night before is, is important. The sleep quality there is gonna be big um hydrating uh, if it's a hot situation environment that you're going to be playing in so those those three prong things we talked about a minute ago are going to be coming into play there uh, uh, uh pretty good as far as uh, match time absolutely thank you um obviously stay in stay in on the the focus of the girls for a minute um obviously the the concerning frequency at which knee injuries acl tears meniscus tears happen on the female side of the game. Um, is there anything that, that you suggest in, you know, I would, I would guess post PHV and 14, 15, 16 to, to help them strengthen their, their quad muscles and potentially mitigate knee injuries. Is there anything that, that you have in place for, you know, ACL, PCL prevention? Um, that you could recommend? Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we have our share like everybody else. I mean, you're not going to stop them. Um, we see a lot of that aspect coming from fatigue uh, if they get, you know, towards the end of the season, late season. And our, our, our schedule is tough because we've got usually two matches a week. And so that, that puts a lot of pressure on the athlete to, to sustain that, that uh, health uh, over, the course of the, over the course of the season. But um, as far as preventative type of work, I mean, I, I can't stress strength, strength, strength. You know, just making sure generally your whole body is strong. Um, you incorporate some reactive type of strength activities as you get your, your, your foundation strength. So that, that's going to include some, some plyometric type of work where you're able to get in and out of the ground quickly, you know, apply force, uh, stabilize force. Those types of things are going to help you on the pitch. Um, it's just preparation. Um, there's some times where it's just, it's just going to happen. It's you put your body in a bad position or it, and it happens. But I think as much as you can prepare or, you know, keep yourself healthy from those types of injuries is, is that strength value, um, some plyometric work. And we use that in our, in our uh, warmups daily. Um, there's some few exercises that you can work on, and I'm sure they, they're probably doing them already. If not, you could get a professional uh, to talk to as far as what you could 
add to your warm up. Um, those things are going to help uh, mitigate as much as possible. Brilliant. And then last one, um, one of the the girls was asking, you mentioned earlier about the, the kind of 5, 10, 15 meter, you know, sprint speed day activities. Um, if those are answered, can you give any inclination as to, you know, time and targets for those? Uh, anything that yeah, you offhand, let me think here. So for the five meters, and again, these are, these are meant to be 100% uh, speed level. So you're, you're going as fast as you can. I think at the five, we, you know, if you can keep it under, I'm trying to think it's one seven or something like that, or uh, maybe, maybe it was under two seconds. I believe that's, that's kind of where I was at. Keep it under two seconds. And, and we take a rest interval of 30 seconds on those five meters. So it's, what is that? Six, six to one. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a lot of rest so that you can reload and come out of the cannon again really fast. I think it's two seconds or under on that. And then the, the, we go, I think we go 15s. I'm not using 10s right now, but our 10s in our, in our um, test scoring, we used a 30 meter sprint test and we will also get their 10 meter time off that. And anybody that's under a one seven is really fast off the line, first step speed for us in a 10 meters. So we, we use that, um, as an indicator of first step speed, which is, this is important to the game. I mean, it's winning a 50, 50 ball. It's making that transition piece on the pitch that makes the difference in, in, in making the play or not. For sure. So just to confirm, so for the five one, it's a repeated test. So it's five. Yes. Minutes. Yeah. We're doing, we usually do. I think we start out with like, like seven, five meters, maybe five, uh, 15 meters. And then we'll finish with like two 25 meters. And then we'll, we'll have a, a 30 minute, 30 second rest in between the five meters. We'll have 45 between the 15s and then a minute rest between the 25s. So again, it's, it's a large amount of rest. It might seem like, Hey, this is not a good workout, but it's not meant to be crawling on the ground, leaving the, leaving the session. You're, you need to be fresh and, and explosive. That's what we're looking for there. For sure. And I think that's a great segue into the question that I'm, I'm going to kind of close with on, tactical periodization for the coaches and how you plan your week because obviously you've said you know it's about the quality of the work that your athletes your players can produce it's about the quality of the practice that we witness not you know I'm not burying them into the ground and you know uh, so if you could just just shift gears a little bit um, you've obviously referenced there the importance of understanding work to rest ratios I'm curious as to the role that you play in practice design and the role that you play in weekly structure um, and whether you can shed some light on the conversations so that you know around obviously you know maybe you've got forwards obviously UNC are famed for, for you know pretty quick strong forward yeah. you want to be you know you want to regain the ball you want to be on the front foot early like um how does understanding that fit into the design of a practice? And, and like we said, what, what role do you play in making sure that players work towards a certain athletic physical output and, you know, don't, don't get buried? Um, right. Yeah, I think, I think our, uh, you know, our setup is, is a little different because we have resources. You know, myself is, is the fitness coach and we have athletic trainers, we have nutritionists. And so we can constantly be, you know, communicating as a staff yeah. you know, as do any pro teams and so forth, um, be able to put that information out on the forefront as far as a day-to-day -day type of application. So it's a little bit different in that in that regards. But with the high school level, you know, we we play we play two matches a week. Both guys and girls will play two matches a week most most weeks. Um, there are some times where it's just one match, so it's tough to kind of um, set those parameters definite each week. We got to kind of go week to week. But if you had a one match week. Um, we're going to set themes each, each day. So coming off, say I play on a Sunday, the next day would be maybe a light session for the um, people that played a lot of minutes. So maybe it's, it includes just some, some good stretching, maybe a, a light strength session of just upper body or core or something like that. While the people that didn't play would, would go into a, uh, you know, practice type of mode to get some some um, energy spent and, and get them up training as well. And then the following day, I think it, we would have everybody off completely so they would recover, rest, and that type of stuff, get their treatments. 
Um, and then we would move into a pattern. Usually it ends up being about three days a week of practice, actual practice time before we have to go into another match setup the day before. So we would try to start with a build up. So it's going to be a lower level, probably a 75 minute session, more tactical, technical type of work. So it's lower level in that regards, as far as the practice intensity. And uh, we'll also put what we call our, our strength theme is that that day. So we'll do um, the whole team will do some type of strength work um, on that day, whether it's on the field or I have them come in the gym. So we're marrying that up a little bit with, you know, taking some of the bias off the practice and moving it into the gym on that particular day. The second day after that would be more what we would call our, our uh, fitness day. So maybe the field is getting opened up a little bit more uh, for before, 5v5, five five, those types of setups where it's smaller fields and the intensity goes a little higher. Um, uh, we'll, we'll finish maybe or start the, the warm up and finish the warm up with a little bit of some acceleration work that's going to kind of mimic what we're doing those those small game areas. And then, uh, or I'm sorry, that was our speed day. And then the last day would be our fitness day. So that's going to be more of an open field, 11v11, 11 those types of setups where it's more opportunity to go longer runs. Um, and, and we would do that in, in blocks of, you know, anywhere from like six to 10 minutes, probably depending on the po point of the year in the season. Um, and then the next day would be our pre-match day. So it would be more open field, but uh, also doing some um, lighter stuff, not as much as far as um, um, practice time and be a, a light session, maybe 60 minutes max, including maybe some, um, some acceleration again, just to kind of get them activated a little bit for the next day for our match. Uh -huh. And again, so it, it, it changes depending on what match the match week looks like. Um, but I think if you kind of build in themes and kind of gear and focus towards a particular day and match that up maybe with your physical prep along with your tactical, technical type of work, I think you you have a good solid plan there. Otherwise, you're just grasping at straws, and you're you you can overload, underload those types of things. We we don't want to overload for sure, but we also don't want to uh, underload, and and we want to make sure we're we're practicing just as hard as we are playing in those particular matches. Yeah, and we we obviously spoke last week about understanding loading curves throughout the training week. So if your average is 10k in a game that you want to make sure that that's I, I think we, we kind of discussed that numbers range anywhere between one and a half times and, and two times that in the training week up to it yeah. so the game is in essence a little easier um, and again for the coaches obviously based on that message that Greg has given you you know you want to always be thinking about these variables that you can manipulate that that ultimately influence the type of load experience so you know the time spent you know, the duration of each activity, the space that you're using, the number of players that you're using in the activity, the frequency of activities, um, and ultimately the rest, as we've mentioned, between activities. So depending on which variable, the higher it is or the, the lower it is, can increase or reduce, you know, the, the, the physical demand placed on players. So um, as we said, if there's a portion of, of developing a speed day, for example, maybe it is lots of little transition games and, you know, you've got a, a small enough numbers in a bigger area where you can allow them to get up to speed. It's, you know, you're not probably going to get it out if you play two penalty boxes from a physical perspective, two penalty boxes and 16 players. It might be mental speed, but it isn't physical speed. Yeah. So yeah. understanding what you expect to practice and an activity to return coaches is super important to being able to, to appropriately you know, periodize your training plan, I guess. Um, so yeah, Greg, thank you so much. Um, wonderful insight. I do appreciate we're, we're, we're right on an hour of being with you and slightly over an hour of your time based on the, the slight <laughs> that we had at the start. So, right. um, so I'm going to say this, it might be disappointing to those listening, but I'm, I'm going to call it and just say a huge thank you. Super grateful for, for your time and your insight today. Um, I kind of promised people a bit of a treat on online, on social media and, uh, and those that received emails and, and it's been brilliant. Thank you ever so much. It's, it's, you know, abundantly clear to me why, you know, as we said, success leaves clues and normally it's in the people that are part of the program and, and what you guys have developed there is, is, is quite incredible. So um, what I would just ask Greg, um, if people are, are curious or, you know, would like to hear more either from you or 
can go and learn more somewhere? Is there, is there any way of either contacting you or resources that you would recommend to players or coaches around some of the stuff we've spoken about? Yes. Uh, I mean, I would just go to our goheels.com uh, website and you can get, get my contact information there. And I'm more than happy to reply to an email, phone call, whatever the case may be. That's, that's not a problem. I do that all the time. Um, that would probably be the best way, but yeah, anytime anybody wants to uh, contact me, feel free to, to look that up and, uh, and do it. Perfect. All right. Well, look, Greg, thank you so much. Um, to everybody listening now, I, I really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, to those listening on demand, um, thank you for, for taking time out today, obviously, to catch up with, with us and choose Beyond Pulse as your, as your dose of, of education. Um, for any of the coaches listening, the next webinar we have on Friday, 1 o'clock Eastern, um, is going to be uh, a dear friend of mine, Sui Smith, who is a, a coach educator back in the UK. Uh, we'll be talking about the importance of communities of practice to, to coach development. So um, relationships, formal and informal with peers and, and mentors, mentees, um, and the importance of continued education on development. So hopefully you can join us then. And uh, Greg, best of luck. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm sure you've You've uh, you've acquired a few extra Tar Heel fans. For yeah, here we go. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Tom. I enjoyed enjoyed the talk. And, uh, and uh, anybody out there listening, still, you know, feel free to contact me. Like I said, good luck with everything. I know it's uh, it's trying times right now, but hopefully we'll get through this soon, and everybody will be be back in, into their their normal routine. But uh, good luck. Stay safe and and enjoy it. Thank you very much, my friend.